left off in the middle, like, you know, last week's episode of the perils of Pauline. <laughs> the, uh, the, the, uh, Israel had, and, and, and France and, and, and Britain, for reasons that we went at the last time, had colluded as the expression goes, had organized themselves into a, a secret alliance with an unorthodox sort of a plan of attack. Uh, the plan that they worked out was to make Britain and France look uh, innocent, and therefore uh, Israel was to invade uh, the Sinai Peninsula, take it over in, uh, in October, a certain date of, uh, of 56. Uh, at a certain point after they did that, uh, England and France and the rest of the world would, would express suitable horror, whereupon, this is the plan, uh, the British and the French would then say, the thing that needs to be done to ensure international peace and to secure the security of the Suez Canal as a, as a waterway for international shipping is for the British and the French armies to come in and physically separate the Israeli army on the one side and the Egyptian on the other side uh, to do it lishma in the shame of, in the name of world peace. And meanwhile, it just so happens that the British would retake the canal as a result of that. The plan was that Egypt, in case they make any trouble, and the plan is they wouldn't make any trouble, they will invade Egypt, knock out Nasser, put in a different government, and everybody would be happy. That was the plan. Uh, they didn't tell Eisenhower about it, as we saw, when Eisenhower was in the middle of a presidential election, but everybody thought precisely because it's in the middle of a presidential election, they'll be able to get away, because we all know the American politician, whoever comes to Israel during the election season, everybody always kisses up to the Israeli lobby. Um, so the specific plan was, uh, there was one cooked up by Moshe Dayan, which was very unorthodox, wanted to make it look like a raid rather than an invasion, although it would eventually turn into an invasion. And the idea was to um, fly uh, parachutists, no, it's to drop paratroopers out of nowhere. In other words, there's no war going on, and all of a sudden, the Israeli planes would fly into the Sinai Desert, which is very long and big, I'm sure you know. Israel is eight, the old Israel is 8,000 miles uh, square, and the Sinai Peninsula is 24,000 miles, so it's, it's three times the size of Israel. And uh, most of the Sinai Desert, and I know I'm looking at this crowd, I know people have actually been there from the old days when Israel still had it, is un uninhabited, it's rocky, it's mountainous, it's all, it's, uh, you know, it's not very hospitable. And um, therefore, it's not like Israel was going into a territory with a lot of people. The population of the whole Sinai at that time was 40,000 uh, Bedouins. And uh, besides uh, some, uh, well, that, no, that's basically what it was there. And the idea was to fly to the other side of the Sinai Peninsula, not the side where Israel is, but the other end, take, uh, 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 land right in front of the Mitla Pass, which are two mountain passes which you need to get through in order to traverse the Sinai. Um, then once they're there, they, they couldn't do like in some movie. I mean, you know, in the movies, you, you land in a, you, you parachute in a pass. You realize that's, a, that's death for paratroopers. I hope you understand that. You don't land people in mountains. Uh, <laughs> some countries have tried to do that. It's called the Polish army. You, know? they, uh, you, you land them in front of the mountains, and then they come in and, and take over the mountains. So um, once Israel landed over there, no one would know if it's just one of these uh, fancy schmancy Israeli counter raids. After all, the Egyptians raid Israel. Is a raid Egypt, as we described, particularly was going on during these years. So this just looks like a bigger version of a raid, and it'd be plausible deniability if anything goes wrong. And then once they land over there, then the an Israeli armor column under Ariel Sharon is supposed to go help them for leather, just charge from Israel, from the Negev, all the way across the Sinai Peninsula to catch up with them as soon as possible. Um, and then the joint force together will storm and capture the Mitla Pass, and then that will choke off the Egyptian forces that are in the Sinai. And then the Israelis, as you'll see in a minute, will launch several pronged campaign, a column up here and a column here and a column there, to try to take over whatever military positions are necessary to take over in order to conquer the Sinai Peninsula. What I'm trying to say is you can't physically, a country size visitor can't physically occupy every inch, nor is there any reason to, of the Sinai Desert, because there's nothing there. Only that the Egyptian army had certain bases over there and certain strong points and places like that, and that's what you want to take over. And if you do that, then you've got the whole business. Recall that part of the plan was Israel's not going to take over all of the Sinai Peninsula, but rather they're going to go up to 10 miles, because the British and the French are going to say, the two sides should all stay away. Israel should stay 10 miles away from the Suez Canal on this side. The Egyptian army under Nasser should stay away 10 miles here, and the British and French will land in the middle. So from the very beginning, Moshe Dayan knows in real reality, we're supposed to take over all of Sinai up to 10 miles before the Suez Canal. Okay, if you followed that, then it's great. Now, um, as I said before, it looks like a, a, a raid. The problem is that, as always happens with the fog of war, the, uh, there's bad information about the B Egyptian positions in the Mitla Pass. 
Um, when they came there, they thought there were no soldiers there, and they found out there were, and then they found that there are a lot of Egyptian soldiers over there, and uh, Ariel Sharon ordered a frontal assault, um, which resulted in heavy casualties for the uh, Israelis, leading to controversy and recrimination. I know that uh, Sharon at this minute is dying. I know you read it in the paper like I read. Uh, you know, the, the vegetable thing is falling apart, whatever they call it. And uh, so therefore, what do the Romans say? The more to us, non less he bonum. He shouldn't say, speak bad about the, the, uh, the dead. But he, he, he was uh, very, uh, for the rest of his life, I mean, till today, their family is very angry at Sharon because they think he incorrectly ordered a frontal assault on the Egyptian positions when he came there, when it wasn't necessary to do so. They couldn't have done it other ways. Most of the time, didn't care. He said like this, you know, in war, the only thing that matters is winning. And so he, caught, he captured it. And so I'm not going to do a court martial or anything like that. He was successful in attaining his mission. Okay? And to be perfectly honest, uh, this is Israel, so you'll understand this very well, especially in an audience like ours. They lost 37 men killed. Now, I'm not saying that's a small number because every person is a lot. But you understand it's not a large number of casualties either in terms of killed. So it's all a matter of relative. In the total signing campaign, Israel lost 230 men. Just you should get an idea of what I'm talking about. And the total war is 230 men, which is... Uh, if you want to get an idea, they were losing something like that from the, from the Fedayin raids, from the terrorist raids, roughly that number anyway. So these are how the numbers work. Elsewhere, once that happens, so then, you know, the Israel is basically without declaring it is at war, meaning they're sending their soldiers into the Sinai, and they go through several columns, as I said before, and um, they easily outflank and defeat the Egyptians in a four-day campaign. That's what it took. It was a four-day business. And uh, which ends the campaign, therefore, is October 29th, the 30th, 31st, and then November 1st, November 1st, four days before the American elections. Okay? So, right when all this is happening is right when Eisenhower and Stevenson are going head to head in the famous 56 election. And uh, this really muddies up the American political scene because, you know, what is this not going to be part of the election campaign? Don't you think Adlai Stevenson, as eloquent as he was, is not going to say, Look at the violence that's emerging in the Middle East. This is a sign of the bankruptcy of the Eisenhower administration policy. They themselves don't even know what's going on. You don't want a guy who's playing golf and doesn't follow what's, what's happening in the world there put me in and all the rest of it. And Eisenhower just steaming and all that. Now, the funny thing is, let's take a look at the next map. You can see over here, it's a little hard for me to see, but the, the Israeli forces moved in, in, in several uh, columns, as you see, totally not about concrete, the sand in the middle, but uh, taking over the strategic positions in there. And this business took four days. That's what I'm trying to show you. Now, um, it was an unusual strategy, but it worked, and that's all that matters. To be perfectly honest, once Nasser heard that the British and the French, after the first day, are talking about landing, he figured out there's some kind of collusion going on, and he told the Egyptian soldiers, pull out of the Sinai, because we're going to need you back home. So, and to some degree, to a certain degree, this happened in 67. So I just want you to know, even though we're all proud about Israel's military victories in 1956, 1967, since this is a history talk I'm giving, if you want to be very honest about it, it wasn't really a fight. Because on both occasions, in 56 and 67, for different reasons, the Egyptians chose not to make a big battle in the Sinai Desert, but to withdraw. You see? Uh, nevertheless, as I said before, all that matters is whether you win. And so... The strategy worked, and as far as Israel is concerned, it was a conquest. Meanwhile, however, the international environment kicked in. Fighting commenced on Monday afternoon, October 29, 56. Consider that, Monday afternoon. By Tuesday, the UN had met to condemn Israel and to demand a withdrawal. Eisenhower had no idea that an actual invasion was happening. He thought it was a raid. And he wrote a statesmanlike letter to uh, Ben-Gurion and basically what he said was, you know, and he could smell a rat because he had the CIA and the U-2 planes and everything telling him. And he wrote to Ben Gurion, he said, listen, despite the temporary, present temporary interests that Israel has in common with Britain and France, you ought not to forget that the strength of Israel and her future are bound up with the USA. Okay? So uh, those active in APAC and all know exactly what I'm talking about. So I thought was, was, was talking talkless as the, as the expression goes. Next day, the, uh, that'd be Wednesday, the Security Council meets. By then, it's clear that Israel is not raiding, but Israel is invading. As the Security Council votes to order Israel back, Britain and France vote against the resolution, which kills it, because they're one of the five permanent members who had the veto. 
So just by voting, so imagine the shock that hits the world and Eisenhower and Dulles when England and France, who until now said, we have your Daniel Le Shop was the dumbest that we don't even know what's going on over here. And then in, in, in England under Anthony Eden, which hates Israel, said like this, oh, the Israeli army should not withdraw from the Sinai. All of a sudden it became clear what's happening. Shocked. It dawns on Eisenhower that something sneaky is happening. And when Britain and France had announced that they're going to land troops in the canal zone, Ike smells a rat. Okay? And as I told you before, he wrote to Ben Gurion right now, he says, I don't know what you're thinking, but you do not want to alienate the United States of America. That's a big mistake on your part. Eisenhower is further enraged that the Israelis do this in the last week of a presidential election. A transparently cynical ploy that, let's face it, would be good fodder for an anti-Semite. Frankly, if this happened today, Israel would be in big trouble. The, you, the, the, you know, the, one of the most important things to keep in mind is this is the good old 1950s. And I don't mean Ozzie and Harriet. I mean the good old 1950s when Israel had a monopoly on the American media. There was no such thing as a Palestinian voice or even an Arab voice of any real proportion in the American media. There was, you know, this is the good old days when there were only three channels, correct? It was ABC and CBS and NBC. And they were just starting with the news. And uh, all the reporters, 99% of them, were just naturally, culturally pro-Israel. That's the way it went in those days. I don't have the time, but I could do it on some other occasion, maybe I will, if, you, if I was doing a media class or something, where you just look at the, you can get online, you look at the um, news reports that they used to show in the movie theaters, right? You know, what's happened in the Middle East, and it's so pro-Israel, it's ridiculous. You know, they don't say Israel, imagine today, today, if Israel invaded the Sinai Desert, oh my goodness, right? At that time, Israeli forces moving to clean out Fedayan nests, and you know, and get rid of the terrorists, it's all pro-Israel. So Eisenhower had to operate within this um, environment, and therefore, the New York Times and the others didn't say, this is a shocking violation of American elections and all the rest of it. But it was, it was, and Eisenhower's gonna win. <laughs> so it's not gonna be something that they take lightly. That's the point I'm trying to say. Eisenhower and Dulles are further enraged because it is diverting attention from the Soviet crushing of the Hungarian Revolution. The Hungarian Revolution took place November, October 23 to November 10, 56, exactly during this time. Again, October 23rd, to, um, to November 10th, it's exactly at a time. And what happened to Hungarian Revolution? There's Stalin's uh, statue being uh, uh, smashed, okay? The Hungarians had a huge uprising. They hate the Russians, who doesn't? And, uh, and they want to kill them all and so forth. By the way, they also want to kill the Jews. I mean, it was a very anti-Semitic, anti-communist revolution, but besides that. And uh, Eisenhower and Dulles were saying, this is great. Now we get to expose the Soviets for what they really are. People around the world, especially in the emerging third world, will not believe all the propaganda that the Russians are the friends of the little man and the small countries. You'll see the fist, and you'll see what it really is, and all the rest of it. All of a sudden, people aren't paying attention to the crushing of the Hungarian Revolution. They're saying, oh, Israel and France and Britain are attacking Egypt, which is a leading member of the third world. Look at the destruction. Go, let's go to the next one, of the Russian tanks in, 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 in uh, Budapest. Notice, imagine like sending tanks into Baltimore and start blowing things up. That's exactly what happened over there. These are, are you know, secret uh, uh, films that were the, you know, the Hungarian freedom fighters smuggled out to the West. And uh, you see, oh my goodness, you know, they're shooting all the, in the parts and all the rest of it. And Eisenhower and Dulles are going crazy. He said, nobody's watching this. They're watching Israel. You see? You, you're interfering with the plan. First of all, you're doing it without telling me. And second of all, you're doing it at the wrong time. You schlamazels. And so the, it was really bad. The Suez invasion gives the Soviets a chance to act as champions of the third world, especially the Arab and the Muslim world. After all, if you're living in the Middle East, I'll give you an example, North Africa, Arabia, Iran, who's the villain? Khrushchev crushing Hungary? Who ever heard of that? Or Israel crushing Egypt? Everybody heard of that. You see? So they're totally messing up the American propaganda line, which is a fact. Um, on October 30th, you can follow the dates, Israel announces right away that it accepts the Anglo-French proposal. <laughs> that was part of the plan. And it will keep its forces away from the canal. Nasser says the opposite, and he calls for military resistance. The British and the French, this is part of their plan, land, armies, forces, they attack and defeat the Egyptians. Okay, so there's bitter fighting. Of course, the British and the French are much better soldiers. So there's British fighting in, um, in the Suez Canal area in what they call Port Said. Right, the, the Ismaili on Port Said, all the, the cities 
that are located exactly on the uh, on the Suez Canal area. And as you can imagine, here the British and the French uh, paratroopers uh, jumping out and landing. Do you understand what happened? You're Egyptian, you're living in Port Said. Next thing you know, you're being bombarded because they bombed the place first. And then it's like D-Day. They land uh, paratroopers and then uh, from, from the sea, soldiers. It was real invasion. Okay? Now the British said, we're only doing this to separate the forces. But there was a transparent lie. And the world could see this and it smelled like a rat. That's the point I'm trying to get at. Um, it's a messy affair. The British thought they'll come in. After all, the Arabs are like nothing. And they'll take over. These were elite British units. And of course, one, two, three, uh, the British uh, resistance will crumble. And then it will reverberate throughout Egypt. And Nasser uh, will go into a panic. And he'll leave or get killed or something. It didn't happen like that. It got to be a messy affair. And it did not lead to the fall of Nasser. Not at all. Uh, let's take a look at this. <coughs> You have the, they're going to show you? The, um, you don't have the audio on that? Well, all right, well, the, the, point, uh, the point of this is that the Egyptian people... <laughs> NASA refuses to go into hiding. There you go. He determines instead to rally his people after Friday prayers at Cairo's ancient Al-Azhar Mosque. And hey, we beat, we beat. He's imitating Churchill. In short, this is Nasser's finest hour, and it is. And recently, a year or two ago, in Egypt, they made a movie, which is a fantastic movie, Nasser in 56. Uh, you know, he's, he's like God. Because he, he held off, think about it, he held off the British and the French and the damned Israelis, and he kept Egypt together. He won in the end. Oh, it's a tremendous victory for him. They see that the, you have to understand, if you're Egyptian, you consider this one of the high points in history, and he was a Churchill. When the country was invaded, he said, hold out to the end, and he won. So you have to understand that the whole world doesn't look at it from the Israeli point of view. Uh, meanwhile, though, in Israel, they're elated, especially Diana Ben-Gurion, because they won a big victory. They're worried all the time, is the Israeli army really worth anything and all the rest of it? And they conquered a huge territory. Let's take a look over here. This is the victory parade that Moshe Dayan has uh, in, uh, in the uh, Sinai Desert, and you see the Israeli soldiers, each one's feeling 10 feet tall, and oh, look at Diana, like standing up, you know, so, so erect. Of course he's proud, the plan worked. And Israel demonstrated that even though they're not a fancy schmancy power, they're able to beat another army and conquer a huge territory and they smash the Egyptians and so on and so forth. So they're not thinking about the international repercussions on that day. They're thinking about the fact that we won, which is totally understandable over here. And Ben-Gurion is going crazy all the rest of him. He's basically drunk with victory. He gives a speech in the Knesset. The Sinai Desert is part of Israeli territory. Ever since the Bible, everybody knows David Amelech had this and Nachal Mitzrayim. I mean, you know, he gives it. later on they asked him, how could you say he said I was drunk with victory? You know what I'm saying? I mean, I'm all in favor of Israeli expansion, but the Sinai Desert had never been put, I mean, it is true we spent 40 years there, but not in, <laughs> but not in that way. You understand? Um, and so, but uh, you know, oh boy, Ben-Gurion, I, I couldn't find it online. But as a famous speech he gave him the Knesset, he says, and, and Sharm el Sheikh, the real name is, uh, you know, uh, some Hebrew name here, and this is the real Hebrew name over here. And the whole business, he, he went off his head. Meanwhile, the, the uh, Israelis, having taken the Sinai Desert, look what I'm doing. They went around and took this, the Gaza Strip from, from backwards, from Sinai direction, because you couldn't defend it that way. And, uh, and when they come in, um, to put it bluntly, the Shin Bed has a list. And they round up all the Fedayin and they shoot them. Okay? This is, this is what they went in there for. Uh, let's see this. With the fences closed, full pressure was brought to bear on the Gaza Strip itself. This has always been a thorn in the nation's side. And as the trap closed in, the Israel Defense Forces were in high spirits. The years of apprehension were over. And sweet indeed it was to tear down the portraits of Colonel Nasser, issued in vast numbers to fan the flames of Arab nationalism and hatred of Israel and the West. In Gaza itself, the Israeli flag was run up, a particular moment of triumph and jubilation. The Egyptian Governor-General of Gaza, 
came to discuss surrender terms with Asaf Sinkhoni. A year ago in Cairo, this man was a member of a spy tribunal which sentenced innocent Jews to death. Now humiliated, he tasted the bitter dregs of abject defeat. The surrender terms were discussed and set down on a hilltop overlooking an Israeli settlement which has suffered greatly from its proximity to Gaza. Committed to paper, the surrender was signed, though few people are still naive enough to put much store by Egyptian promises, undertakings, or agreements. Now, it doesn't get better than this. This is a South African Zionist Federation movie taken at that time about shown to all the Hadassah meetings of the Sinai campaign. So you're going to get a totally balanced picture over here. <laughs> an objective, an objective for Israel. But you want to know something? It shows you how Israel is feeling, how the Jews are feeling. It's like, wow, it was, it was, it was a tremendous uh, shot in the arm. And um, by the way, right in the middle of all this shooting, in the Port Said area where the British and French are, Israel sent a special boat, a uh, uh, secret mission with Ari Eliyav, uh, who was a very well-known activist on, for working for Ben Gurion, to take out the 200 Jews who live in Port Said and Ismailia, okay? Because first of all, they could get killed in, in, in the shooting, and second of all, if if the British and French withdraw, what happens to them? Okay, the, the, the Jews will slit their throat, and I don't blame them. And the French, to their credit, they send like a certain battleship, and they put the 200, they take them to Israel. You see? So it's it's interesting all the little details that happen in the middle of it. Meanwhile, however. Eisenhower, who's in the last week before the election, takes the decision. He says, I guess I'm not going to let just be a regular politician and be pushed around and, and forced to say things they don't believe. He's angry because I'm American. And Eisenhower is running what's going to be a triumphant second election anyway. But I got to tell you something. The level of political discourse is kind of interesting. Eisenhower, tremendous charisma, and he did because he was a general in the Second World War. No, 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 you can't take that away. But they sold him like you sell soap. Okay, and uh, and he knew this was going to win, therefore he's just waiting till November sixth to get the election out of the way, and then he can do what he really goes. But I've had a, what are what are the great appeals to the intellect and the high discussion of public affairs that go on an American television in 1956 in order to back the re-election of America's most famous general? Let's take a look at this. I for president, I for president, I for president, I for president, you like I, I like I, everybody like I for president. We got the virus in the gun, we'll take back to Washington. We don't want John or D or Harry to do that big job right. Step get in step with the guy like that, get in step with I. You like I, I like I, everybody like I for president. We got the virus in the gun, take back to Washington. We got to get where we are going. Now you can laugh at it, but look at the map. That's all Eisenhower. <laughs> so you don't laugh with success. They sold them like soap, you know? This is, you understand this is all the Republicans. I know nowadays the colors are different. Eisenhower won the entire country except for this, okay? So uh, even though he was not backing Israel, I want you to understand what I'm saying over here. And he basically said to the American people, he said, you stand with me because I'm not giving in to all these partisan political considerations? And he got, by the way, 25% of the Jewish vote, too, which is pretty big for Republican. So it's quite a business. And Eisenhower is a fascinating person to study from the point of view of American history. I'll speak about it a little bit uh, more uh, later. But safely re-elected, and he's re-elected for the last time. He doesn't have to run ever again. Eisenhower is free to do whatever he wishes to France, Britain, and Israel. And the question then becomes, what will he do? He's all uh, cheery over here in Israel, and Ben Gurion saying, "Gulp, you know, <laughs> what, what what happens now?" And uh, as a super, now here's the thing: Eisenhower was not anti-Semitic. I want to be very clear about this. Not at all, and he wasn't anti-Israel either, and not at all. I don't say he would be in favor of the creation of Israel in the first place, but why would he? 
You understand? I mean, you know, that, that makes sense. But once Israel was there, remember, Eisenhower was the one who liberated the concentration camps. So, you know, don't, and, and, and he wasn't a prejudiced kind of person or something like that, whatever the image is. Uh, a very balanced, a very wise person. He, he is, especially in retrospect. That time, people didn't have respect, but the historians, more they know about him, is more respect. It's very interesting. Many of us grew up in the Kennedy Johnson era in which they always used to dump on him, but that's actually inaccurate. And uh, now that he was reelected, all the rest of it, he takes a look and understand this well. As a superpower leader, Eisenhower sees things from a global perspective, which is a perspective quite different from the narrower perspectives of the British and the French. First of all, the invasion of Egypt has opened the Mideast to the Soviets. And he's right about that. After Suez campaign, from then on, Russia comes in with both feet. So what was the point? He made everything impossible. It used to be that the Middle East was a bastion against Soviet expansion. Whatever they wanted to say, the Russians were kept out. And now that crumbles. Khrushchev and Mao Zedong threatened to flood the Middle East. They said this during the invasion with volunteers. You know what that means. As they had done in Korea. This gets them a lot of support. In Syria, for example, which immediately moves into the red camp. Right up, starting with, with, with the Suez crisis, uh, Syria will, will become pro-Russian, Egypt will then become pro-Russian, Iraq over there will become pro-Russian, and then all these states, many of them, throughout the Middle East will become more and more pro-Russian, and the original Eisenhower idea, or Truman idea, of trying to hold them out of this territory, because they're Muslim and they shouldn't be sympathetic with an atheist regime like the Soviets, and after all, the Soviets are just another form of um, traditional Russian uh, imperialist expansion, and anyway, the Russians are oppressing, million, truthfully, millions of Muslims in Central Asia, all that will shed, all that will fall away, and instead, the Middle East that you and I became familiar with years ago will emerge, in which the Russians are very well accepted over there, and they, they're like them even to this minute, as you know. For example, who's the one holding up Assad? I don't have to tell you that, right? The, you know, the Russians are, are in there with bases and all the rest of it. Uh, then Khrushchev, during this crisis, threatens to nuke Britain and France. I mean, literally. Uh, he says, we're going to drop eight bombs on London and Paris if you don't get it right away. To Israel, Khrushchev writes, you are gambling with your very existence. Right? Now, these are nice, ambiguous terms, but, you know, and Ben-Gurion understands what's, what's being threatened over here. The British freak out. It's a parliamentary democracy, very sensitive to public opinion, and mass demonstrations spread out all over England, especially in London, as you'll see in a second, in which they go crazy and they say, Anthony Eden, get out of here. You're getting us into World War III. We're going to destroy the country over some stupid business with the Suez Canal. You know, uh, stop this right away. Let's take a look at this. Eden had the awful realization that he had totally misjudged the American aspect of the affair. Eden's plans are unraveling fast. He has not anticipated this level of hostility from the Americans nor from his own people. If he is sincere in what he is saying, then he is too stupid to be a prime minister. Leader of the Labour Party. The most demonstrations in London as big as demonstrations in Egypt. And there is only one way in which they can even begin to restore that tarnished reputation. And that is to get out, get out, get out. So it was the opposite of public, no, what developed was the opposite of public support. In Britain, which is a parliamentary uh, uh, country, as you know, uh, France, less so, but you had that problem over there also. Now, was Khrushchev bluffing? The answer is yes. We know now. But who knew then, right? Who's going to say, uh, I'm sure you're not going to drop the about, oh, I guess I was wrong. I mean, you know, <laughs> you don't want to be in that situation. Now, fascinatingly, we know today Eisenhower secretly, because that's who he was, I told you he didn't like to do things in public, secretly sent a, a, a warning to the Russians, which is stay out or else. Hey, let's see this. The threat of another war was very real at the time. Now, later, there was a period of war we should have known they were bluffing anyway. But at the time, it was a very serious matter. Eisenhower made it clear to the Soviets that if they became involved in Egypt, he would retaliate and, as he warned, hit them with everything in the bucket. I did make a very, very threatening categorical statement that uh, if the uh, 
Soviets attack the West, make any move toward the West, they will be destroyed as sure as the night follows the day. And, you know, the Russians respected Eisenhower with a general enough to say, we're not going to play with that. But nobody knew this at the time. And Eisenhower was thinking, what are the Israelis coming in those mess? Or what the British and the French, what they do all this for? In addition to being angry over the new opportunities offered to Soviets, Eisenhower was angry over the oil question. Now, this is a very complicated matter, but it's not that complicated. These are the oil pipelines, right, which provide the oil to get to Europe. Uh, if they're cut or sabotaged, guess what? It's a disaster. And Eisenhower was saying, like this, how, did he, how does a country like England and France, who are so totally dependent on Middle Eastern oil, play around with something? What were they, what were they thinking of? Their economy is going to be destroyed overnight. And that means America will have to help them. Now, listen, in 1956, you're going to cry what I'm about to show you in a minute. When in 1956, in the good old days, America did not import oil. At that time, we, we still had enough of our own. We, we did our own oil. You know that? Um, it was coming. We were using it up. And later on, we'd have to start importing it. But not in 56. So America is OK. Uh, but Europe isn't. Um, now, America this time, uh, oh my goodness, how much was it? Who, who remembers? How much was it? What, was a gallon? What's that? Well, that's 23 cents. You'll see in a second. You know, <laughs> you know said when Rebbe saw this, he cried. <laughs> you see, uh, but it was what it was. So this country was pretty safe as far as the oil is concerned, but not totally. Let, take, take a look at this. this. Some people, especially the young people, won't believe what they're going to see over here. You know, this is a gas station in, in 1956. I had 23, <laughs> tw 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 what, 23 cents. And wait a second. And what else did they do for you? They washed the car. Do you remember this? They do. They, 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 okay. They, 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 do, they do the tires. They look under the hood. They add all for free, right? It's all part of the price. Okay. So that's, okay, okay. We have gave you dishes. Now, I told you. Oof, any, any other comments? No, but seriously, I know what you're all coming from. This is the America of Eisenhower. That's the reason I'm showing you this. Right. Plus, I want everybody to cry a little bit. But he says, "This is this is the, the Americans did before the Arabs uh, uh, turned the spigot off." Uh, but at this time, we didn't need the Arabs. Now, Europe, on the other hand, gets its oil from the Middle East. And if the Middle Eastern countries, when they see the invasion by Britain and France, they, they want to, you can turn it off now. <laughs> they, when, when they see this, they want to cut off the oil to Britain and France. And Eisenhower is telling them, "Take it easy. Don't do that. I'll get them out. Don't cut off the oil. Cool down. We'll make this all work." You know, so on and so forth. If it happens in 1956 that the Arabs cut off the oil, the U.S. will have to supply the oil to Europe. And the gas, God forbid, can go to 40 cents. Eisenhower will be impeached. You understand? He, he is not in favor of that, of that scenario. You get it? The dollar said, like you said, it could go to 40 cents. You know, it would be a disaster. So... Um, to, to be, to, w without being um, funny about it, uh, it was a real uh, problem. And as the leader of the free world, by the way, Eisenhower is exquisitely sensitive to international economic stability. It's actually very interesting. Eisenhower as the president was famous for not spending money on the defense. There are many generals and admirals that quit under Eisenhower because they say, you, we saw your general, you spend the money in the army. And he said, as a general, I know how much is wasted and I know what it hurts the economy. Here, the, take a look at this. He's very, he was a unique among the presidents. By the time Eisenhower is president, there is a huge new flow of cash into defense industries. He was the first to acknowledge that a permanent military establishment would be required during this period. But then unless we could find some kind of breakthrough, that in fact it would end up creating a terrible cost. The cost of one modern heavy bomber in the business. A modern brick school made more than 30 cents. These two electric power plants, each serving a town of 60,000 population. And these two fine, fully equipped hospitals. We pay for a single fighter plane with a half million bushels a week. We pay for a single destroyer with new homes that could have housed more than 8,000 people. This is not a way of life at all. Maybe two cents. Under the cloud of threatening war, it is humanity hanging from across the line. 
Okay, my Jed. Mother is president. Getting strong. And, and that's enough. You, you get the you get the impression. I don't do the whole thing. Eisner was very sensitive to the balance. Uh, he was afraid of what would happen, which did happen, of course, which was we're broke now. We're, we're how many trillions in the hole? And, and we're not getting out of the way I can see or anybody else can. And in other words, you, you can have defense and bankrupt yourself. And that happened to Russia 20 years ago. And it was, he was terribly afraid. I mean, you have to give him credit. He foresaw this uh, long before it happened. And his last speech, I'm sure you all know, is when he warned against the acquisition of unwarranted influence by the military industrial complex because it would, it would bankrupt us. You see? And so um, he's, I'm saying this in praise of Eisenhower. Here he is in the Suez crisis, the signing campaign, and he says this can interrupt the international economy, the flow of oil, the price of energy, ruin the country, and, you know, uh, and, and, and this is very bad for America, or it has the potentiality of being very bad for America. So it's not a joke. You know, Israel has just done something unilaterally. England and France has just done something without thinking about it. I got to look at the whole picture over here, and I'm responsible because of the largest country for the whole free world, which was not a lie. I'm saying this is not anti-Semitic. This is not anti-Israel. It's a it's, it's a real consideration. Um, and so all I can say is we have enough hindsight today that to understand because you have to be objective or try to, uh, at least I think so, that Eisenhower and Dulles work very hard and successfully to keep the Arabs from doing what they eventually did 17 years later after the Yom Kippur War. Okay, you remember that? When all the, uh, the, 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 the there was a gas shortage, as you see over here, and, all the, and the cars and everything lined up. That could easily have happened in 1956. And he worked always behind the scenes, that's his style, you know, and always, you know, secretly, and it did not happen. So you have to give credit where credit is due because he was looking from the American point of view. And by the way, you know, in retrospect, I would not want to think what would have been the reaction anti-Israel had the gas gone, all joking aside, had the gas gone to 40 cents in the 1950s when we still had those big gas guzzling cars and everybody would end up blaming on the Jews. That would not have been good, my friends. Now, um, meanwhile, as far as the English and the French go, Anthony Eden and Guy Mollet, they say to Eisenhower, you're all wrong. If we don't act like wimps, the Arabs will know their place and they won't dare to embargo us. They're thinking like in the old pre-World War II days, We'll never know if they were right, because it's true that the Arabs were scared of a big violence. Who can tell? But with Russia as a factor in now, this was just not realistic. Eisenhower and Dulles say to France and England, you're nuts. I mean, that, that is the word they say, you, you guys are crazy. Meanwhile, as far as little Israel is concerned, they hold on to their conquests, but they look like the aggressor, and Dulles is determined Israel will not get away with it. Um, now comes uh, all the big United Nations votes. And now comes the, 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 the finest hour of Abba Ibn, or one of them, because he goes to the United Nations as Israel's ambassador there, and he's able to, 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 to as, as only he could, uh, to turn the issue into one in which Israel's the victim. You understand? And he makes the argument to be made, and that is, uh, I'll just read you very briefly over here, I couldn't find it online, surrounded, he says, understand where we're coming from, surrounded by hostile armies on all its land frontiers, subjected to savage and relentless hostility, exposed to penetration raids and assaults by day and night, suffering constant toll of life among its citizenry, bombarded by threats of neighboring governments to accomplish its extinction by armed force, overshadowed by a new menace of irresponsible rearmament, embattled, blockaded, besieged, Israel alone among the nations faces a battle for its security anew with every approaching nightfall and every rising dawn. In recent days, the government of Israel had to face a tormenting question. Do its obligations under the UN Charter require it to resign itself to uninterrupted activity to the south and north and east of armed units practicing open warfare against it and working from their bases in the Sinai Peninsula and elsewhere for the invasion of our homes, our land, and our very lives? Or on the other hand, are we acting legitimately within our inherent right of self-defense when having found no other remedy for two years, we cross the frontier against those who have no scruples in crossing the frontier against us. Right? And he goes on to say, there is aggression, there is belligerency in the Middle East, but we for eight years have been its victims and not its authors. And he, I won't read the whole speech, it'll take too long. But, uh, you know, he, 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 he was Israel's best uh, uh, um, speaker. I mean, we all know that. And, uh, and he's able to make an impression in the world. Uh, John Foster Dulles was, uh, you know, went over to him afterwards just as a professional speaker, one speaker today, he said, I see he didn't have any notes or something like that. And I'll be even showing him that he had three lines that he worked out of. And Dulles said, holy cow, except he didn't say cow. Now the, uh, 
the uh, so he, he he pulled it off. But that's not going to turn everything around. But at least it looked like Israel just not some aggressive. Put a little bit of context on this. We didn't just decide one day to invade the Sinai Peninsula for fun. Uh, there's a background to all of this, right? I mean, how would you like it if you were England or America or something like this? If you were raided by terrorists all the time, you and I know what the United States has done ever since 9-11 and with the full support of the American people. And so he said, we've been under this for all the time. Eden and Malay, the prime ministers of, of Britain and France, had figured they could stymie the United Nations through their veto in the Security Council, which is true. However, this opens the door for communists for red volunteers, which was Eisenhower's worst nightmare. So to prevent this, Dulles looks over the rules of the United Nations very closely. He was a famous lawyer, and he found uh, that there was the United Nations General Assembly Resolution Number 377 from November 1950 called the Atchison Plan. And that means that during the Korean War, uh, Stalin, using his veto, had stymied everything in the, in the United Nations. And then Atchison, who was the Secretary of State on Truman, figured a way to use the General Assembly to do the things that the Security Council is not able to do. And, and Dulles said, let's use that now. And this allows the uh, General Assembly to initiate uh, measures over there. Um, the General Assembly, so in other words, they immediately get the whole General Assembly together. That's all the nations of the world. They uh, vote to order a ceasefire. And you can't veto there. And the sending of a United Nations army to the Suez Canal area. Eisenhower then threatens Britain and France, behind the scenes as always, that if they do not submit, America will cause a financial panic in their countries. In other words, he has a masterful use of soft power. Basically, the United States is probably even in this situation today. Consider those of you who are investors. All America has to say is, you know, if any kind of trouble happens in this, in this country, the United States will not really back their currency. If you had money invested there, what are you immediately going to do? <laughs> right? It'll be a crash. Everybody pulled the money out. You see? And in the 50s, the gold situation is still under the old um, Bretton Woods agreements. So the United States controlled the gold supply. So if the American bank, the central bank, says, we're not, even if they say it like I'm saying right now, we're not sure if we'll supply the necessary gold for all this. Anybody's got any money in, in, in Britain, gone. And what does that do? The British economy collapses, and it's like the 1929 crash, instantly. And Eisenhower didn't have to do a thing. He didn't send any soldiers. He didn't make any speeches. He just said, I'm not sure if we'll be totally able to, and he said it privately, he didn't say it publicly, because if he said it publicly, that would cause the crash. And he didn't want to do the crash, you understand? He just wanted to have the effect of being able to force England and France out. So he's saying, behind scenes, he says, I'm not sure if I'll be able to do what's absolutely necessary to help you guys, this, that, and the other. On the other hand, if everybody leaves, I'm sure that we'll be able to find out. That's all it took. Now, it didn't happen overnight, but it happened. Anthony Eden is up the creek, and so his health collapses at that time, and he just crashes, and he goes to uh, Bermuda for a month, right, to recover. He had, bad, he had I don't want to give you the, the uh, GI stuff, but he had a, a, a bad illnesses and so forth. And uh, the result is that he flees the country. John Foster Dulles that week came down with colon cancer. <laughs> I kid you not. I'm sure a lot of people cursed him, you know. And he gets emergency surgery, emergency surgery right during this whole Sinai campaign business. And it gains him another two and a half years of life. And Anthony Eden's absence, which takes place over four weeks, eight weeks, uh, Britain obfuscates. But nevertheless, over the course of November, December, Eisenhower very politely insists that they withdraw. Otherwise, there'll be no help for your economy, and it'll crash. And the British eventually do. Britain and France had promised Israel they wouldn't do so. They would not leave Israel alone. But hey, things change. <laughs> right? And this is Europe. Eden, Anthony Eden, is defiant. He is unwilling to admit that he's wrong, ever. His policy was half-baked. Britain was simply an honest broker. Look at this speech he gives. He says, we are totally uh, right and honest in this whole matter. He's got a, a real politician's face. Came the entry of Israeli troops into Egypt. Was that a dangerous situation? Was it likely to lead to a widespread flare up in the Middle East? In the judgment of the government, it was. Was it likely to endanger widespread British and international interests? One. Well, it's possible to go on arguing who was the aggressor. Was it Israel because she crossed the frontier? Or was it Egypt for what she'd done before? 
But that's not the real issue for us. If you see it far, the first question isn't how it started, but how to put it out. The hard and inescapable fact was that here was a situation likely to inflame the whole Middle East with all that this would mean. That, in the government's view, was the fact of the situation, a driven hard fact, the reality which no words could alter. Now, of course, it's a bold lie. <laughs> he makes it sound like you know we were faced with this situation. We had to intervene for the best, for the help of world peace. Um, collusion with Israel? Chas uh, Shalom, right? That Ben Gurion is so angry at this because remember he didn't say I don't know who was right. Maybe Israel was right. Maybe Israel was right. Ben Gurion is very tempted to stick it to him. He just published in the in the New York Times. Well, what does he care, right? But he didn't do it. Ben Gurion says if I gave my word to keep it secret, I'm gonna keep it secret, and he never did um, reveal it. And that paper from Sever, Israel still has it in uh, Ben Gurion's house. They they won't open it. And uh, what's it called? State book here. All the rest of it. Anthony Eden was so grateful <laughs> that he wasn't totally exposed as a liar because he stood in Parliament and said, we know nothing about this, that he does 180 and becomes a lover of Israel. I kid you not. <laughs> right? And in his older years, there is when he's an old man, he's the chairman of the pro-Israel Society of England, of the conservative friends of Israel. You should read, if you want to have fun, read, you can get in the library, the memoirs of Viscount Eden, and you know, especially the last years. And, oh my goodness, when it comes to Sinai, Oh, the Israeli armor heroes. He says, Ariel Sharon did this, and Moshe Dayan did this. You think he's a member of the ZOA or something like that, <laughs> right? Because he was always He was very grateful that Israel never exposed him, so to speak. And so when the word got out by dribs and drabs over the coming years, during his lifetime, I think he died in 1970, you know, it never quite, they, they didn't publicly embarrass him. So it's really funny, this guy who took Arabic as his major in Oxford, who was an Orientalist, who was a lover of Arab culture and a hater of Jewish, uh, but in the last 15 years of his life became uh, the you know, Shabbos guy. It's unbelievable. <laughs> as far as the French are concerned, Guy Mollet, he says to Ben-Gurion, he says, listen, I'm, uh, France is stuck. I'm ashamed to say France has to leave you in the lurch. France feels ashamed, but we're stuck. What can we do to atone? So Shimon Paris said, I guess, what about A-bomb? <laughs> <laughs> And, and that's how it happened. You know, Malay said, okay, we'll, we'll, look at, we'll, we'll, we'll give this fable consideration. And this began a process where, as I told you last time, and Mir Sashem will, will deal with this next year, uh, in the aftermath of the Suez uh, crisis in the middle of 1957, uh, France actually does go whole hog and, 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 and give Israel the full cooperation to help them develop their nuclear research. They never used the word A-bomb, of course. To help their, 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 their nuclear pe peaceful research. But it's, it's a compensation patch package because France felt guilty that they left Israel in the lurch in 57. Right? It's amazing, okay? And Shimon Peres was always the right guy at the right time, as I told you last time. He's always in Paris. This would help, <laughs> okay? Um, and so, uh, having pushed out Britain and France, it took him two months, November and December, but having pushed up 56, Eisenhower now turns to Ben-Gurion. No? <laughs> Ben-Gurion says, we will leave if Israel makes peace with us, real peace. Then we're willing to withdraw, and so on and so forth. If Egypt. Isaac, I mean, if Egypt makes, obviously. He said, we'll, we'll, we'll withdraw if Egypt makes peace with us, a real peace. Eisenhower says, no, you'll leave now. <laughs> <laughs> Nasser says, peace with Israel? Why should I make peace with Israel? They invaded us. What did they deserve that I should do peace? The opposite. This has confirmed their essentially aggressive nature and how, how, how evil they are. Under pressure from Eisenhower, Israel withdraws partially and slowly over the course of November, December, but holds on to a line running from El Arish Sharm El Sheikh, which of course includes the Gaza Strip. You understand, notice they, from the Israel held on to where I'm pointing here, right? Uh, not half, you know, the last quarter of it. So they, they, they let the Egyptians take over all of this, the middle, and the part adjacent to Israel, let's put it that way, especially the part that has Sharm El Sheikh at the bottom, which controls the entry to the Gulf of Aqaba, the Gulf of Eilat, that's what they still held on to. Um, Nasser doesn't have to do anything. He said, I said I was doing all my work for me, uh, which was true. Now, Ben-Gurion then digs in his heels, and he says, we will not withdraw from the rest unless we get security guarantees. We want no more Fedayin raids, no more blockade of Eilat, etc. Doc Hammarskjöld, who's the Secretary General of the United Nations, is so angry, somebody wants to benefit from aggression, 
becomes a matter of principle to him, and he says there should be no reward from aggression. Israel must withdraw without anything. After it's all over, then we'll, we'll consider the situation. The king of Saudi Arabia, King Saud, he says, if it, America doesn't get the Israelis back to the old frontier, we'll close down your bases over here, and we'll make an oil crisis. Okay, this is the wrong guy. This is the, the, the father, but it doesn't matter. The, 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 you, get, you get confused between Saud and Ibn Saud and all that, but it, it, there are such people. Anyway, the, the, fa the fact is that uh, the U.S. needed big Dharan. You know, remember, you, you've heard about that in the paper. You, you, the U.S. has gigantic air bases which they need for security versus Russia in uh, the Arabian desert, besides from the oil itself. And um, the king of Arabia is like this. He says, why should we help America if you're not going to get Israel out of there? Um, Eisenhower said, like, Israel is such a pain. Right? We, 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 where did you guys come from? Ben-Gurion said, without guarantees, we will not move. Eisenhower said, well, let's do sanctions and force you to move. Same thing with, Israel, with England. I don't have to lift a finger. America depends on the American aid. They couldn't get along without it. You know that. Dollar says UJA, don't have to even do that. Just make it that the UJA is not tax deductible. You cut down by two thirds at least, or more, the, uh, the amount of money that the American Jews sent to Israel. America doesn't have to do a thing, you see? And the Dulles was not wrong about that. Meanwhile, Abi Ben is on the American news all the time, swaying public opinion. He was Israel's secret weapon. He goes on CBS, NBC, you know, all the shows over and over again. And Abi Ben, of course, is so eloquent. He said, We're ready to go. We really don't want to go back to Fedei in raids and we got the blockades. Why should we? Why does Doug Hammarskjöld insist on this? Now, if Israel has a position too, why is it necessary just to satisfy the idea that the aggressor should not gain from anything, that we should literally go back to a situation in which, what, you, you, you put the terrorist bases back in there and then start negotiating again? That doesn't make any sense. Um, Eisenhower is adamant and he says, we have to do this and... Um, I don't want to blockade Israel. I mean, I don't want to um, sanction Israel the rest of it, but if they won't leave, then this, if it's necessary to do so, they'll do so. Um, he can't do it. This is LBJ's finest hour, <laughs> okay? Uh, Johnson was the Senate majority leader. The, Republican, the Democrats had one vote majority. In those early years, it was one vote for Republican, then next time was one vote for the Democrats. It was like 48 to 47, something like that. And, uh, and Lyndon Johnson, I'm sure, I'm looking around, I think everybody here is old enough to remember what I'm talking about. Uh, he knew how to get the votes. And he tells Eisenhower, he says, I guess he says, you do whatever you want. I'm telling you right now, this is a personal thing with me. There is no way under any circumstances that I will allow you to make any sanction against Israel. That's it. You see? And I got the votes to do it. And Eisenhower tries to reason him, and he says, I'll get the House as well as the Senate on, on, on my side. Dahl said, let's try the Republicans. The Republican leader in the Senate, the minority leader, Senator William Nolan of California, very interesting guy. Uh, he was the best friend of Joe McCarthy. He's an extreme right-wing Republican, but, he's, but you can't tell. See, people nod their heads. You don't know everything. Uh, American politics is more interesting than that. This guy, who was a, a super McCarthyite and anti-communist, all the rest of it, was a leading senator on civil rights, and he's also a leading senator for Israel. So you don't know. You see what I'm saying? We, we, the the, the uh, facile assignment of people to certain categories reminds me of like the worst aspects of Shachanim, you know? It's, 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 it, it's in there. And so Nolan tells Dulles, he says, I'm against this too. The Republicans are, you don't have any votes for this in the Senate. Okay? And so stymied, what does Eisenhower do? He turns to Abihel Silver. Okay? Now Abihel Silver, of course, had been Mr. Zionism in America. Not only that, Abel Silver was a big macher in the Republican Party, even though he always voted Democrat. <laughs> Interesting? Okay? Uh, again, you can't tell by facile uh, classifications. Okay? By the way, my best story, somebody here, maybe she's here tonight, two years ago I spoke about Abel Silver, somebody here came to me afterwards and she said, my father was a from Jew in Cleveland, and he was a big fan of Abel Silver, always went to hear his, his Sabbath sermons, and uh, even though it was Orthodox Jew, he went in there, and I said, what did you do about Shabbos? All the rest said, oh, no problem. The services are always on Sunday. It was real reform. <laughs> they didn't have services on Shabbos. You know, the, 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 the real, real, real reform. Anyway, uh, having said that, though, I can tell you right now that uh, when Eisenhower ran in 52, Truman, Kedarko, so I guess, any Jew that vote for that anti-Semite can go straight to hell. That's what Truman speaks. 
And uh, who said Eisenhower was anti? So Abba Hill Silver made a whole speech, and went around the American communities and said, "I guess you can vote for Eisenhower. You can vote for whoever you want." But Eisenhower is not an anti-Semite. I know him. Okay, and uh, he's a regular American, and all the rest of. It. Excuse me. Oops, Jake. I don't know. I guess it is. I can't afford to play with that. Okay. You may regard that as a commercial break. <laughs> But uh, Abba Hill Silver gave the, uh, spe the, the prayer at Eisenhower's inaugural. You understand what I'm saying, right? And uh, you look what the New York Times says over there. They moved him to tears, Eisenhower. Um, because, uh, he, you know, this, look, he was in Dachau, you understand? I mean, it, it meant something to him. If a Jew said like this, he says, Eisenhower's an honest man. Uh, you and I think it's all politics. People care about their integrity. Some of the guys ever did also. And to be validated by Silver was very important. The reason I mention this is that uh, in, in, in crisis situations, it's very interesting. Eisenhower felt very uncomfortable talking to Ben-Gurion. He felt like a brick wall. But Abba Hill Silver, he said he'll get the message to Ben-Gurion, even though he didn't realize that Ben-Gurion didn't like Abba Hill Silver because of Zionist Jewish politics. But what else is new? Anyhow, um, Silver talks to Israel's influential friends in the Republican Party and in the Eisenhower administration. He speaks to Tom Dewey, who had been the Democratic candidate, uh, the Republican candidate for president in the 40s, and to Walter Beadle Smith, who, was the under, who just resigned as Under Secretary of State, the, had been Eisenhower's Chief of Staff during the Second World War. These are pro-Israel, big macho Republicans, and he's saying like this, he says, explain to Ike that Israel's not in the wrong on this, and if you, if you put in sanctions, it'll wreck the country, and the country will go down the drain. Take it easy over here. Still, it's not simple. Eisenhower will not yield on what he regards as a matter of principle, a matter of international law. You see, to Eisenhower, a breakdown of international law will recreate 1931. They say 1931. That was only 25 years before, when the Japanese took over Manchuria, which was against the law, and the League of Nations didn't do anything about it. And you know what happened? That showed everybody they didn't get away with it. Next thing, Hitler and Mussolini came along. Next thing you know, the whole world was engulfed in World War II. So if Israel is able to hold on to the territory simply because they conquered it, then who's to stop another country from doing the same thing tomorrow and the day after? I tell you again, Eisenhower felt he said, I have to look at it from a global perspective. I can't do these little narrow-minded things. If only the world had put his foot down. Henry Stimson had been the Secretary of State in 1931. He said at that time, if we stop Japan now, we'll stop World War II coming and the whole world will lift and it didn't work. So he was right. So the American tradition in the State Department of American Diplomacy, which is not a bad tradition, is one in which says we have to stand for the maintenance of international law, and that's why Bush went in uh, when, when Saddam Hussein invaded uh, Kuwait and things like this, because the alternative is much worse. It's very far from a perfect world. I understand all the hypocrisy and all the rest of it, but consider the alternative, and Eisenhower's generation had lived through the alternative. And anyway, Ben-Gurion said like this, Ben-Gurion says to Eisenhower, what about Russia? You're not kicking them out of Hungary. What about international law over there, right? You're not doing anything about the tanks in Budapest. And Eisenhower said, what? Are you comparing yourself to the communists? Are you comparing yourself to the atheists? That's what he says to Ben-Gurion, okay? And I, Eisenhower, stymied by LBJ, and by also he was stymied by the sympathetic media and the sympathetic elites. I mean, here's the big rally that takes place right during the Sinai crisis when Eisenhower is threatening Israel. There's Eleanor Roosevelt next to Moshe Dayan, and if you see been behind was John F. Kennedy. I mean, they, Polo Grounds. Remember in Manhattan? Anybody remember that? So, um, well, it's the big... Uh, yeah, right, the Giants. So, uh, what do you call it? The Israel's having huge rallies in which the leading members of the white Anglo-Saxon Protestant establishment are lining up in favor of Israel. I tell you again, it was a golden era. <laughs> it's, a, it's the Ozzy and Harriet for the Jews. The uh, people saw it from Israel's angle, and Abba Eben is giving a speech over there, and uh, oh my goodness, you know, that, that's the way the American public was doing. Ed Murrow was the number one uh, journalist at that time. He was America's number one. They remembered it from the Blitz. Here's Ed Murrow going to visit Ben-Gurion to get his take in the 50s. <laughs> thing. What do you think is, is the right way for you to go? <laughs> what do you think? Ben-Gurion's going to give you a, a, um, an even-handed answer? That's where the American public was. So Eisenhower takes his case to the American people 
in a remarkable and blunt television speech. Okay? Uh, you can see the words over there. I won't take the time to read it all, um, but, but, uh, but it's, it's, it's quite powerful. And, and, he, and he puts it, uh, lays it on the line, and he says, listen, I don't want to hurt Israel, but on the other hand, you can't let them get away with it. And as he said, we're not going to apply to Israel the same uh, 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 standards that you would do to the atheist despots of Russia. Okay? This is supposed to be a democratic country. This is supposed to be a country that regards itself as a member of the free world. So you can't just unilaterally go and break the law, as it were, and take over somebody else's territory and expect the United States of America to go along with it. It's not going to happen. And therefore, I'm pushing to Israel. I'm asking you, the American people to back me over here um, on this because it's a matter of principle. Now, you have to understand, Eisenhower had a tremendous charisma and a tremendous authority. I want to tell you, I didn't have the whole speech over there. Only, in, only he could get away with this. You know, Eisenhower was the only guy in the 20th century who was elected president of the United States who was bald. Okay? The, many have written on that. And that means, uh, of course, Stevenson was too. But nevertheless, uh, it's something. He gives a speech and he says like this. He says, my fellow Americans, I have a cold tonight, so I may have to blow my nose and cough a few times. I beg your pardons beforehand. Can you imagine uh, in this media age, somebody would do He doesn't give a darn. You understand? He says, I have nothing to prove. I won World War II. You elected me and re-elected me. I, you know, I, I, I can say it the way I see it. It's, it's remarkable. And he says like this, look, you've got to stand behind me, because otherwise, if, if Israel gets away with this, the whole thing breaks down. That's what it is. And so the result is, then Abba Ibn says to Ben-Gurion, sends him a telegram and says, you're pushing I too far. You make a big mistake. You understand? Don't do this. You know, if he blows up, you're in big trouble. He's a nice guy, but you're going too far. Ben-Gurion says to Abba Ibn and Golda Meir, then, okay, then go get the best deal you can get. And here you have Golda Meir, uh, who is a, pri a foreign minister, right, the Minister of Foreign Affairs. She goes to Washington over there, and Golda Meir and Abba Ibn tried to nail down Dulles, and they say, you know, uh, let's take a look at the next thing over here. Now that's a lie. That's one of the things you can't believe in the news. Dulles was a Wall Street lawyer, very slippery character if he wanted to be, and his, his client right now is the United States of America. And what Ben Gurion and Golda Meir and Abi Ben wanted Dulles to do was to sort of sign on the dotted line to guarantee certain basic Israeli demands. Number one, no more terrorists, no more fitting in in the Gaza Strip. Number two, no blockade of, uh, of a lot. If you get Egypt to agree with this, we withdraw. Nasser says to Dulles, we're not withdrawing, no way. Right? Like I say, why should I? Dulles says to Hammarskjöld, how about if the United Nations occupies the Gaza Strip? He's already thinking like a lawyer. I got this client over here and this client over here. Can we come up with something in the middle? How about if the Egyptian army doesn't take over the Gaza Strip again? But how about if Israel gets out anyway and the UN sends a peacekeeping force over there, an army over there, to do, to do that? Hammarskjöld says, what does that mean? Will Egypt approve? Nasser said, well, we will not formally approve, but we'll informally be glad anything that gets the Jews out of there. You see? And uh, Dulles says to Dag Hammarskjöld, will the United Nations take over Sharm el-Sheikh? So the Egyptian won't be there, but they'll be at the, at the gateway to the, uh, to the entrance of the Gulf of Aqaba. And uh, once again, uh, Hammarskjöld says to Nasser, do you agree? I know, I, can't, I won't say I agree, but uh, you know, in other words, yes. Okay? And uh, you know, if you, if you don't cause me to say anything, so I'll agree. So this is a real good lawyer deal. You understand? He said he's trying to make everybody happy. Golda Meir says, Nasser's not signing anything. He's not committing himself to anything. This is a temporary trick. After a while, he will reoccupy everything, and we, be, we will be back to square one. Which, by the way, did happen in 1960. That would happen 10 years later. But right now, Dulles says to Golda Meir, look, the perfect is the enemy of the good. Right? Golda says, well, what, what will the U.S. do if Nasser reoccupies? Dulles says, we can't guarantee that. But we can guarantee, I can't guarantee what, what Nasser will do. But I can guarantee what the U.S. will do. No, let me rephrase that. We can't guarantee what the U.S. will do, but we can assure you, <laughs> as a lawyer, what the U.S. will do. Which is, we will regard the Gulf of Aqaba as international waters which may not be blockaded. Golda says, does that mean, you understand though, she's trying to hammer it out. Does that mean that if Nasser blockades in the future, you'll break the blockade, run ships through there? 
Dola says, we cannot guarantee that we'll go to war. That's up to Congress. Then Abi Ben says, well, again, here's a good idea. Let's make a defense treaty with the United States, like NATO, which commits the United States to break the blockade. And Dulles says, uh, no. <laughs> Dulles says, look, after all, you know, and you, know, you get what I'm saying? There's all these sessions going back and forth and forth and back. And Dulles says, look, it boils down to this. You've got to pull out. There's no two ways about it. If you pull out now, you will have the sympathy of America and the Western world. If you do not, relations will sour big time. Ike is not fooling. Consider, American sympathy is really your most important asset. I repeat, American sympathy, not formal alliance. You may not like that, but that is really the best Israel can hope for. Such are the facts of your life. So, as your friend, your attorney, as it were, take this deal. Pull out, and America will be your friend, though we will never be your formal ally. Abi Ben says to Ben-Gurion, this is the best deal possible, take it. Ben-Gurion says to Eshkol, who is the finance minister, how long can we hold out if America cuts off the money? Eshko says, a few weeks, maybe. <laughs> Ben-Gurion says, okay, in that case, <laughs> get the best deal you can, and then we'll pull out. Dulles says, we promise that we don't formally commit to the UN occupying Sinai and Gaza, and the UN running the Gaza Strip, and to sending ships through, we will send ships through to a lot, and agreeing that it's an international waterway. And that's the most we're prepared to do. In March 1967, uh, 57, Israel pulls out reluctantly. They withdraw from everything. Eisenhower said, I'm happy that you decided to listen. You will not regret this. Ben-Gurion says, oh, we won't regret this? Does that mean you'll sell us weapons? You'll make a NATO treaty with us? Uh, no. <laughs> Nasser, meanwhile, says, I never agreed to any of these dollars and eight-bound deals. In spite of what I just said, Nasser does not kick the UN out of Sinai and the Gaza Strip, though he reserves the right to do so. See, he's not interested in starting a war either again, although publicly he is, of course. On the other hand, he does take control over the Gaza Strip. So Ben-Gurion had been promised that the UN will run the Gaza Strip, not Egypt. Nasser sends in, but the, it's Egyptian police, not the Egyptian army. So the Egyptian police from 57 to 67 are running the Gaza Strip, which is a very unusual type of situation. Nevertheless, although he said he wouldn't, Nasser did respect the agreement until May of 67, as we know. This resulted in Israeli gains. No Fedayeen bases in Gaza. Consider that. Okay? Um, thus, a relatively, I emphasize, relatively quiet israeli Egyptian border for the next 10 years. Unlike 52 to 56, which I've described to you in detail, from 57 to 67, it's one or two a year, which is pretty good. That's, you know, that's as good as it gets. You understand? Um, is, is one or two or three a year, where it used to be one or two or three a day or a week. Um, so the border got a lot quieter on, as far as that's concerned. Um, uh, they got a, also a demilitarized Sinai Peninsula because part of the understanding was Egyptians wouldn't set up uh, large military uh, um, things in, in the Sinai Desert. That's left to the United Nations. And so, although Nasser didn't realize it, probably been going either, Israel gained something invaluable which was a tripwire. Uh, this is what they used in 67. Consider, here is the Egyptian army, where I'm pointing over here, behind the Suez Canal. Here's Israel, of course. It's impossible for Egypt to make a, a surprise attack, because first, the Egyptian army has to go in and take over the Sinai Peninsula, which is a logistic business, takes a couple weeks. So automatically, anytime Egypt wants to do anything against Israel, it's going to be with a, 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 a long lead time for Israel to find out about it. That's the sign that, it, that, that Egypt is getting serious about war. That is what happened in, 50, in May of 57, right? That he went in, uh, 67, and he went in and, and, and didn't go out. And of course, we know it led to the, the Six Day War. I can tell you that there was a, a mistake in um, 59. I'll we'll deal with this next year. It's a famous uh, a mishap where uh, the Egyptian army went into the uh, um, Sinai Desert in 59. And all of Israel went to a panic, and, and, and an officer, Mayor Zorea, and, and the uh, high command ordered a full Israeli mobilization, and Nasser said, what happened? It was a screw-up in communications, and immediately sent a message to Ben-Gurion uh, through, uh, I forget which intermediary, it's like, this was a mistake, we're pulling out over here, and that's what happened, they, both sides pulled down. So I'm trying to tell you, although nobody planned it, it turned out to actually be something, a valuable defense tool, I would say even for both sides, but certainly for Israel. 
kept them both far away from each other, even though you understand that Egypt still owned the Sinai Peninsula and Egypt still formally controlled the Gaza Strip, but not really. And so Israel could look at this as, as, uh, as real gains and also an unblockaded a lot. Now again, Nasser said the blockade is still on, but his army on purpose is not in Sharm el Sheikh and nobody's enforcing it and Israel's going in and out. That's what happened. And also, don't forget the extra little bonus over there, a bomb. <laughs> right? Israel got a bunch of, of uh, goodies, in other words, out of the, the Sinai campaign from the Israeli point of view. And, and finally, uh, I would say Israel got tremendous military prestige. Okay? Now, Israel always sells itself under Ben Gurion's time as uh, leading the world in peaceful matters, scientific uh, uh, research, and the social advance, and all which is true. I'm not taking that away. But the fact of the matter is, Israel got real prestige after 56, because everybody said, like this, ooh, they won a war. You know, they're, they're, they're tough. Uh, Israel's amazing. What's really remarkable is Israel got tremendous prestige um, in the third world, which should really not be in favor of Israel for practicing naked aggression against Egypt. Here is um, some of the main leaders. What is it? Israel, too, had gained from the war. It had, for the time being, removed the Egyptian threat from its borders and shown the world it was a power to be reckoned with. After this war, everybody, every country, every Arab country understood that it is not easy to destroy Israel and Israel is strong enough to defend itself. Until 1956, there are thought that Israel is a phenomenon that will disappear. It's a temporary phenomenon. Uh, only in the 56th war, they realized that this is, that we are here to stay. Under pressure from the Americans and the United Nations, the Israelis withdrew from Sinai the following year. But Israel's victory had given its army and its people newfound confidence for the future. I think eventually we gained 10 years of quiet, of um, the ability to develop our industry, our economy, and our army to such a level that when the war came again, we not to renege on, on his previous abstention from uh, flooding the Sinai with forces, and he put his entire army, we could defeat. So you get the idea. The interesting things that I was saying for even in the third world, look over here, there's Golda Meir with the leaders of Kenya. Uh, Jomo Kenyatta and uh, Tamamboya. These are famous people from yesteryear. And uh, seminal figures in the African in the, in independence movement. And uh, they're very interested in Israel. They say publicly because of Israel's social development and the kibbutzim and all that sort of thing. But behind the closed doors, how'd you win the Sinai campaign? <laughs> you know? Where'd you get your tanks? Where'd you get planes? Because that's how countries are. And uh, by the way, as a result of this, so, so uh, Golda Meir is able to launch all these programs in Kenya, uh, part of which is that they uh, do all these scholarships to help African students go around the world. One of them is a guy named Barack Obama Sr., okay, who ends up, that's him, eventually comes to America and marries this uh, girl over here, who the, the children of the President of the United States. So, uh, you know, <laughs> let's put it this way. If you like conspiracy theories, and I know in the Middle East they love conspiracy theories, you have to understand, the entire election of Barack Obama is dated back from the Sinai campaign, where as a result, Israel got his entry into the African independence movement and used that to start an uh, education uh, fund in order to get Barack Obama Sr. And if, you, and, and, and if you laugh at it, I get it, but you know and I know, I can guarantee you on some website somewhere, somebody's pushing this kind of stuff and millions of people are believing it. As clear as day it is to them that Barack Obama Jr., the President of the United States, a Zionist plant from long ago, and look how clever the Israelis are. Short of oil, approaching bankruptcy, with an absent Prime Minister, and publicly criticized by Eisenhower, the British government had no choice. The United Nations moved in, and the British and French moved out. Again, the militia triumphantly marched through the streets of Port Said, and the crowd saluted Egypt's hero. For Egypt, this was NASA's victory. You may not uh, all story about, about how gallant the, the Egyptian forces uh, fought this uh, last pitch battle in, in Port Said. Militarily, it was, it was defeated. 
But all of a sudden he appeared as somebody who survived an onslaught of three major powers. Now Israel became a power, you know, but France, England, and Israel. And, uh, and he survived it. And not only did he survive, but the canal remained nationalized. Every war has got a price. At the end of the war, the man who has the price of the war in his hands is the winner. And there is no other criteria. So it was pleasant for so even though I know so, some people told me that they, they were laughing that the Egyptians in 67 said we won 10 years ago, we're going to win again. From their point of view, right, since they came out on top in the end, they won the war. Now I understand how much, uh, you know, uh, self-aggrandizement uh, goes into all that, you're lying to yourself. But you could also understand the way they saw it, okay? And they were determined to read it that way. So Nasser emerged with glory. It is precisely because both sides gained something that this patchwork agreement of Dulles and Eben held for a decade. You understand? It could not have held if both sides were inside. Dulles, at the end of the day, was a clever lawyer, wasn't he? You know, in order to make an agreement, what's the main thing you have to have an agreement? Both sides got to have something to walk away with. You see? And, uh, and, it, and they did. It's the only thing is, in the long run, the structure was too, was too wobbly. In uh, 67, now, but to tell you the truth, you know, he just made a mistake, Nasser, in May of 67. He did not have to go this route. And uh, he made a series of, of errors. If he would have been a little more cautious and so forth, um, it wouldn't have happened. And uh, the, the, the basic idea of the structure was not a bad one, even from Israel's point of view. Look, consider comparing it to today. At that time, the, the Gaza Strip was still the Gaza Strip, and it's full of Arabs that hated Israel, all the rest of it. They weren't shooting at Israel. You didn't have Hamas. You didn't have the Fatah. You didn't have any of that kind of stuff. You had a, a civil administration by Egypt. The United Nations controlled uh, the, the frontier areas. They wouldn't allow anybody to shoot missiles into Israel. I mean, it's as good as it gets. You see? It doesn't get better than that. So even though people made fun of John Foster Dulles, and they say he's an anti-Semite, all the rest of it, it's not really true. He put together a deal that, that kind of worked, but the structure was too wobbly. Israel expects and hopes that as a result of their concessions, they'll get better treatment from the U.S., during the second Eisenhower administration, would they? So uh, wh wh which way will it go? Okay, um, that is something, of course, we'll have to explore next year. Uh, here's Eisenhower meeting with the Muslim Brotherhood <laughs> right? in the second administration, which that time was considered a very positive anti-communist organization. Um, history is very interesting in its permutations, but as I say, I'll leave the future for the future. Good night, good luck. Israel after the um, 73 war, the 67 I should say.